Yeah, well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. My first chance to attend this uh, wonderful meeting. And I have to say, when I saw I was the last speaker of the day at a meeting at a beach resort, I thought this is going to be the highest degree of difficulty. But you're obviously a, a wonderful audience uh, staying through the end. And it says a lot about the meeting that Deborah and Jenna create, that it, even at a beach resort, it holds everyone's interest, uh, interest so well. And uh, just these uh, next slide, or do the buttons work? Blue. The, the, the button right in the middle. Ah, okay. the green. 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 It is not. Yeah, ah. there you go. Okay. Wrong way. Keep on going. There we go. So I was going to talk a little bit about radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is something that about half of the tumor patients in the United States will at some point get treated by radiotherapy. I was going to describe a little bit about how it works and how it's given, <coughs> how it can help increase the cure rate with gastric cancer, and what we are learning to help us better help people with radiation once the tumor has spread, and uh, in keeping with the theme that many people are mentioning, are developing knowledge of immune therapy and harnessing the immune therapy, there are ways that radiation in the future is likely to help those agents work better. Uh, I first uh, you know, became in contact with this organization and with Deborah, not just through my role as a radiation therapy doctor treating this, but through uh, my role as uh, chair of the NCI group, taking over from Dave Ilson, that manages and uh, helps coordinate the development of our national NCI-funded clinical trials. And I know you get to see the contribution the group makes in patient education, but we've seen how it's been helping with the research effort. Uh, Deborah is our most reliable patient advocate in attending all our phone calls and has given us advice on trial design to make them more attractive to patients and address important questions. Uh, the lobbying effort of this group and uh, increasing funding for gastric cancer research has been very important. Uh, as you've heard, uh, since it's not the most common type of tumor, the drug companies themselves are not incorporating this into their studies of novel drugs at the beginning is they'd like to target a bigger market. And especially the money that you raise for uh, grants for young scientists, for new people entering the field are important because if there's no funding for them, then there's no opportunity for them to pursue this as an area of interest if they'd like to have a job. And so they would then uh, study other tumor types where they can pursue whatever their particular scientific interest is and uh, be able to do their work. So I think all of this is very important. Uh, radiation therapy really is just an x-ray beamed at the area of the tumor uh, that you or your relative may have. It feels like an x-ray. People feel nothing when they get it. And it's given by a machine that looks like a giant x-ray machine. Uh, the person lays on a table and the beams can be aimed from different angles to try to hit the tumor. And the beams can be shaped, the exact shape that's needed. Uh, it happens that the first patient we know of treated with radiation for gastric cancer was reported in a paper in, in French in 1896, was a patient with gastric cancer. Uh, this uh, patient was treated 60 times uh, with uh, sessions of about 15 minutes to a half hour, and it was reported that the tumor shrunk. Uh, but we didn't know much about, or they didn't know much about giving radiation then, and a lot of bad things happened, skin breakdown, the person was eating better at first, and then everything just went downhill. And I also found another interesting thing. When uh, Thomas Edison was developing the electric light bulb, he was trying different things. And one of the light bulbs uh, was giving off radiation similar to the type of radiation they had available, uh, available back then to treat tumors. And they also used radiation to treat infections. I don't know if you can read it on there, but he comments, uh, and one of his assistants died with a lot of injuries from the radiation skin falling off, breaking down, a lot of horrible things. And he comments uh, in his writings that he concluded that this would not be a good way to create light. It would be very unpopular. <laughs> and sometimes I know that I am unpopular because what we do uh, you know, does cause a lot of side effects. 
but it does help kill tumor cells. It kills the DNA of tumor cells. And people still research why it is uh, that it kills more tumor cells than normal cells. But it appears to be that whatever it is that makes tumors grow out of control also prevents them from repairing radiation damage. A simple way to think about it is that a normal cell will stop and say, I'm damaged, and try to repair itself. But a tumor cell will try to divide without intact DNA, and therefore will die off. And it's much more complicated than that. But that's a simple way of thinking about what it's doing. It also may injure the capillaries, the small blood vessels that supply the tumor, causing it to die that way because of inadequate blood supply. Uh, but still, the challenge is to protect normal tissues so that people don't end up like that first stomach cancer patient, the first person treated with radiation, uh, and that uh, they can do well. So we have several means to try to keep this safe. Uh, first, again, we use the biological property that tumor is more injured than normal tissues by the same amount of radiation. And that's particularly the case when radiation is given little by little in small daily doses. It's almost as if normal tissues can fend off small packets of radiation, but the tumor is still injured by it. So you could take advantage of that. And that's why you or your friends going through radiation have to come back for five to six and sometimes more weeks every day to get it little by little. Uh, radiation can also be aimed, and that's what we've gotten better at. We understand now how to divide the radiation to keep it safe, and we're much better at aiming it now as computer control technology has developed. And so we can protect a lot of normal tissues and aim it pretty precisely where we want it to go. Uh, the advantage to radiation, though, is in, by doing it, uh, is in one sense we want to target it very well. But an advantage of radiation is also perhaps the opposite of that. The reason that radiation can work in situations where surgery may not always work is that by giving it little by little, we can treat large areas. We can treat areas that the surgeon can safely remove. We can treat areas where tumor may be hidden. And we know from studies of different types of tumor where that might be. And we can hit it without even seeing it just by aiming a radiation beam through that area. And this was a classic paper from a study done in the 1960s and 70s, I think at the, at the Mayo Clinic, where they decided that before there was CAT scanning, before you could find tumor coming back when it was still small, that they were going to operate on gastric cancer, then operate it again maybe six months or nine months later, uh, hoping to see small recurrences while people could still be cured. And a map was done showing where the tumors tended to come back early on. And they figured this is probably where it's been hiding all along, and the surgeon couldn't see it. And so then this became what, what people back then thought would be the correct thing to do. OK, that's where it's likely to be. Let's aim radiation at that area after the surgery's done. And maybe we can prevent recurrences. This was eventually studied in the large study that you've heard about several times today. And one good thing about being the last speaker is I get to uh, build on other things that I've said and respond to what other people have said. So I apologize if I vary a little bit from my slides. Uh, but the, the thing on your left uh, was the initial report of this study, surgery alone or surgery with chemotherapy. And uh, as you heard, about uh, five years later, uh, there was an extra 10% roughly chance of uh, being alive. Still not the odds anyone would want, but it's something you could do for four to six months, and five years later, a really meaningfully higher chance of, uh, uh, of being, uh, being well. And then recently, a long-term analysis uh, uh, was done, and this benefit can continue 10 and more years later. So it really was increasing the long term survival rate. And people ask, you know, you look at this and say, well, why should I do something like that? It's helping some people, and, uh, but not perhaps most people. But it really helps some people a lot. And it is a little bit of a gamble, but the people who win from going through this can then have a normal full, uh, full years ahead. And that's why we recommend this. Uh, 
Then uh, to build on this, and people have tried different chemotherapy drugs, and we're getting better at giving this treatment. So I think when, the, when and keep in mind that those people in that study were treated 25 and 30 years ago, that's why we know the long-term results. We're much better at it now. And a lot of times when you look on the internet at what the outcome of tumors were, you have to keep in mind that, again, these were often people treated a long time ago. We're much better at managing the side effects of chemotherapy now. We're much better at radiation. Surgery is much better than it was. And so we think that the 10-year outcomes will be better now than they are then. But as you know, we still need to improve it. So the large, the next NCI national study that's likely to open in curable early gastric cancer will be try to find a way to see if the treatment's working very quickly for someone. And if it's not working, try something different. The question came up earlier about giving treatment before surgery or after surgery. One advantage to giving it before is that there's still a mass there. You can see if it's working. And so before putting someone through six months of something, you could check them, and if it's not helping them, switch to a different plan. And this study will use PET scanning. Uh, that's the orange spot you see. That shows metabolic activity, how active a tissue is. And tumors are very metabolically active as part of their abnormality. The image that's in gray, that's a CAT scan, and that just shows you anatomy and shape. And long before you would see a mass shrink, we can see that its metabolic activity is getting better when it's hit by chemotherapy. So this study, which is still being finalized and designed, will test doing this quickly after treatment is started. And if it's not working for that person switching to something else, it would be a huge advantage to people if you could find a way to do this. And also, the other large ongoing trial outside the United States, across Australia, Europe, and Canada, will be to see if radiation helps. You had heard earlier about the MAGIC regimen, and in that regimen, just chemotherapy is given. And we don't know uh, how much the radiation is added for all the side effects it causes, especially nausea and decreased appetite in people who already may have undergone partial or total removal of their stomach and already having difficulty eating. Uh, many of the patients who see me, and I, I don't know if this is of interest to you, but many of people who see me often ask about the words they've heard that describes radiation technology. It might be because I'm seeing a lot of people getting a second opinion, and they've been told about equipment, and we have the same equipment here that you'll find at the other places you visit. But I'll, I'll go through this very quickly uh, using my New York heritage and talk even faster. Uh, but radiation... Uh, used to be just crudely aimed. You'd have a beam. You'd almost often guess where the tumor was. This is a tumor in the brain, and you'd know where the surgery scars were. This is even before my, before my time doing radiation, before there was good scanning. They would just argue, aim a couple of beams aimed at where the tumor was thought to be. But then, with advances in desktop computing, uh, we're able to make good three-dimensional images. Scanning became available, uh, again, even before my time. I know you'd look at me and think I was one year out of training, but I've been doing it for a while. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, uh, uh, but now we can use your scans, MRIs and CAT scans, to make three-dimensional pictures of your tumor and the normal structures in your body and figure out how to aim the radiation beam from each direction shaped to what we want to hit and blocking what we want to miss. This made it possible to give more radiation safely. And it got even more complicated after that. With better powered computer, we now can divide uh, the picture of your body uh, into little boxes and calculate how much radiation each box will get to make sure nothing is getting too much or too little. And this is called intensity modulated radiation. And then we can make parts of the radiation beam more intense or less intense, modulate it, to make sure no normal box is getting too much and no tumor box is getting too little. 
as if you had a flashlight beam you can not only shape to project like a rabbit onto the wall, but uh, as you see on the right, you can make part of it brighter and part of it less bright to make it match exactly the pattern that's wanted. Uh, and with this, we can get very complicated aiming of radiation. My other area is treating the brain, and you get more dramatic pictures of the brain, so I've still included those. But here's something right between the eyes, and using this, we can hit that thing right between the eyes and yet miss the eyes itself. And the same thing applies to treating stomach cancer where you're trying to protect the liver and the kidneys. The next development has been an important thing in managing tumors after they may spread or come back elsewhere in the body. That's stereotactic radiosurgery. Uh, what it means, it's a very highly focused, precisely aimed, very, very intense beam. It's useful only for areas where you know that's the tumor right there, where you're not going to hit normal things. And it's very intense and damages it. Uh, it's very effective because you can give an enormous dose. It's very convenient. You're often giving it over one to five days instead of over six weeks because, again, the aim is so precise. You don't have to give it little by little. So you're not hitting normal tissues. This, again, is a is a brain case where we're treating spread to the brain. This person had a bunch of little spots, and we're giving almost no radiation to the normal brain. We would never have pictures of this in treating a tumor in the stomach because in the stomach, the problem with giving an enormous amount of radiation is the stomach itself. That's easily injured by radiation. So you can't easily give enough radiation to successfully get rid of a tumor without surgery with radiation because it would damage the stomach uh, far worse than surgery does. Uh, but in the brain, uh, when we aim very precisely in the brain, oddly enough, you can do this. And in the brain, we can give these intense beams of radiation, and it will have as high a cure rate as, as removing it with surgery. Uh, and this is called radiosurgery because the people who invented this were doing it in the brain because they could in Sweden in the 1970s. Because the brain you could hold still, they could bolt a frame onto someone's head, and they did scans of the brain in the frame, and then treated them using reference marks on the frame for at aiming precisely. This was only usable in the brain for a long time. That's how I fell into being a brain specialist. I did this, wanted to do this. Uh, but now we have numerous technologies that could do this even in moving body parts. The one I have access to is called the CyberKnife, and it's probably uh, based on Defense Department technology, but it constantly takes images of the person during the hour they're getting this intense radiation treatment, and even if they move, the machine detects that and moves along with them. It could look at anything you could see on an x-ray, a bone, Often, uh, often just a little, um, often piece of metal can be in, put in a, by a surgeon using a needle that the machine can track onto. So in very intensive treatments can be given to things outside the brain. Things outside the brain are not still. Every time you breathe, they move. And that's why technologies like this are needed. Uh, but this is allowed uh, in gastric cancer and other types of tumors in the body for tumors to be better treated if they should spread around the body. It used to be that radiation was only used as a comfort measure with not, a, not necessarily an idea that it was going to help very much. Tumor had spread to a bone and it was hurting, and you could give some radiation and, sh and shrink it. Uh, but you know, people were researching whether aggressive treatments, intensive treatments of a tumor that spread would help. Uh, whether if a tumor spread to the lung, if you remove the area of spread with surgery, would that help? Removing spread to the brain, would that help? And removing spread to the liver, could that help? And they found if you did surgery, there was a group of people doing well many years later, five, six, ten years later, even though they had a tumor that spread. But it's not always practical to do that with surgery. Only so many operations people can go through before it's just too dangerous and too much. And a lot of things are just dangerous to get to, dangerous to remove. Uh, 
The reason that radio surgery, this finely focused radiation, is caused, called radio surgery is the guy who invented it in Sweden thought it'd be a safer way to do the same thing that surgery did. You could give this enormous radiation that would destroy what you were trying to get rid of the way a surgeon could remove it. But all these beams could get there without damaging what they went through on the way. They would aim the beams from a, from a couple of hundred different directions. So every beam is weak, going through a normal area, causing little injury. And only where the beams all met would a lot of radiation be given. So as this has become practical to do, people can go through this over and over again in different parts of the body. The idea came up, well, if people have tumors that are spreading, but just to a few areas, would this be a good thing to do? Uh, and on the left, you see like a rendition of a person when they're initially diagnosed. They have one area of tumor, and it's removed. The big area is removed. Then chemotherapy is given, because there might be small areas that are left somewhere, or even small areas of spread that chemotherapy is powerful enough to get rid of. And then people wondered, and that was why surgery was studied, well, would it be the same if a tumor had grown back in just a few areas? You could remove the bigger things, and if you gave chemotherapy then, would that be enough to get rid of the little other spots that may be there? Uh, and then finally, there's the case where, unfortunately, the tumor has just, uh, has just grown in, in many, many spots. And that's when it's not possible uh, to safely treat all of them. But now we have many patients who get a lot of years, uh, a lot of uh, years just every once in a while having a new spot treated. I hate to use the expression, and never did, uh, but many of our patients brought this up and, and referred to it this way, uh, that you're saying, so you're going to play whack-a-mole, and anytime something comes up, you'll treat it. And I would have thought people would have felt that was too flippant. But patient after patient has said, oh, so you're just going to do that, and you can do this over and over again. And we're like, yes, we can until it may become just too much to safely do. But with this, this is a lung cancer that has spread to the brain. And if you would treat it aggressively, remove the lung mass and treat the tumor that's a spread to the brain with either surgery or this intense radiation, even after spread to the brain, and again, this was something done 15 years ago and we're better at it now, but even then, five and more years later, 30 to 40% of people would still be around doing well. And you would think that spreading to the brain, that would just be impossible, but it's not. If it's limited with aggressive treatment, people can do well. We also know that we can monitor people who are moving. We do this in the liver. And again, in the liver, the same thing, as long as it's just in a few spots, and it's not unfortunately becoming uh, very, very uh, widespread spread around the body, uh, you know, three, four, five years later, you know, uh, maybe one out of every three people will, will still be doing well, even though they may be dealing with us more than once. It may be that it shows up in one spot or two spots in the liver, and then we have to do it again. Uh, but still, usually this is very easy to do. It is aimed very precisely. Uh, many of our patients uh, do not have side effects that they consider that meaningful. There's always something, but later on, most people say, oh, that really wasn't so bad. If I have to do that again, that's not very hard at all. Uh, the final point I'd like to hit on, we have what we know that radiation-containing regimens can improve cure when the tumor is still localized, confined to the stomach, that intensive radiation can play a role in people of limited spread, and that less intensive radiation can help pe keep people comfortable when, that's, uh, uh, when they reach a point where that's the important goal. But there also is immune therapy, which is exciting to all of us patients and physicians, and you've heard about that several times today. And I really just put a similar slide up to remind me to maybe repeat something that you've heard a few times today. But getting the immune system to uh, 
help fight cancer has been, a, has been a goal for many years. I remember being back in high school seven years ago when I was in high school uh, that uh, they brought us like, to a science fair at a major university, Rockefeller University in New York, and the big lecture was by an immunologist saying, one day we're going to be able to use cancer to fight tumors. Uh, and uh, and uh, nothing happened out of that. That was a talk for many, many years. And unfortunately, it's been 30 or okay, more than 30 years. But now it's finally happening. And what really was going on, we, we were trying to rev up the immune system to fight cancer. But all the while, there was another signal telling it to stop as if you were driving your car uh, with a brake on and wondering why you weren't going faster. But these new drugs remove that stop signal. Tumors hide uh, by disguising themselves as a part of our body so the immune system doesn't attack it. Because if the immune system attacked the normal body, you know, then, 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 then the game's over. So the immune system is blocked from doing that. But this, these drugs now overcome Part, that blockage partially, allowing it to recognize the tumor in some cases. And the earliest drug developed that did this well only works in melanoma. And it wasn't as good as the drugs being tested now. But because it was the earliest, we have long-term results. Uh, and again, uh, even though with melanoma that it spread around the body, the chances of someone being around 10 years later beforehand were pretty much unfortunately, as close to zero as possible. Probably not exactly zero, but close to it. Now, uh, with that drug, that was an early drug, may, almost 20% of people were doing well 10 and more years later. Uh, so that's, that's a big deal. Again, not the odds you'd want, but, uh, but still a big deal <coughs> moving forward. Uh, and uh, these newer drugs are likely to work better uh, that are working in lung cancer uh, and other types of tumor. But we now have the thought that radiation may help this to work better. This is the last thing I'd like to quickly go over. There, have been, there were a lot of reports like this one from the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the most famous, because it was in the New England Journal of Medicine. But a melanoma patient was on that older drug, and their tumors were growing little by little. Uh, uh, it stopped working, and they were starting to grow. And then a big mass popped up, and it was treated with that intense type of radiation. And after that was done, the tumor started to shrink everywhere in the body. And that scan was put into the article to show how they dramatically shrunk, even though the tumor was not aimed at, the radiation was not aimed at that part of the body. When the tumor in one part of the body was hit hard with radiation, the tumors everywhere began to shrink. And the thought was it was because uh, when there was destruction of the tumor in one part of the body, the immune system might recognize all that debris. And it might be more complicated like that. The radiation may affect the immune cells in other ways. But it was allowing the immune system to recognize the tumor, and therefore the immune system worked everywhere. And they went back to blood samples they had, and they showed that immediately after the radiation, antibodies that targeted the tumor dramatically went up, and that's why the tumor was shrinking all over the body. We have a big immune department at Johns Hopkins, and we've done experiments in animal models uh, with a variety of tumors, uh, not gastric cancer yet, but lung cancer, breast cancer, melanoma, and in animals, uh, radiation can work at controlling the tumors. The immune drugs work, but when you give it together, we found a dramatic benefit in animal models. And when we study uh, the blood and the immune cells, we find that there is a biological reason for this, that the capability of the immune system to target the tumor is better after an intense dose of radiation and the immune drugs given together. This is one study uh, in a type of tumor called uh, glioblastoma. And the, of course, uh, I'm showing it because the line that shows the animals living the longest that's circled uh, was when both radiation in that intense fashion and one of the anti-PD-1 drugs you've been hearing about were given to the animal. A critical thing, and I don't have a slide in about it, was that they did the next step. Those animals that lived a long time that they thought were cured of the tumor, they then injected the tumor again. 
uh, and those animals, the tumor did not survive, uh, showing, uh, in all eight of those animals, showing that the immune system was likely giving a durable benefit. And as you've heard, it's possible to get too excited about results like this. But, it, uh, but these drugs are working in some situations in humans. These laboratory studies uh, show that uh, there's a biological basis that this combination may be quite effective. And there are those isolated reports uh, in melanoma patients on immune drugs that were not working well, then they get this kind of radiation and it works better. So we have a study we've just started uh, in melanoma patients getting an anti-PD-1 drug who are going to get intense radiation because they need it in one part of the body to see what happens in the tumors elsewhere. This may be a role for radiation in the future. Uh, and so that's, again, is my advertisement for radiation. Again, thanks for staying around till the end of the meeting to listen. <laughs> And what questions do people have? Yes, do we have any questions on radiation therapy? I have one. Um, Dr. Kleinberg, isn't it true that if you radiate uh, cancer uh, in an organ, uh, you can't radiate it again if it recurs? That, and if so, why? So, uh, we th uh, so the, that concept is being challenged a little bit now because our technology is better. But uh, when radiation damages a normal organ, often what has happened is that the blood supply, those small blood vessels, the capillaries, have been damaged. And uh, we know from years of study done 40, 50 years ago, before, yes, before I was even practicing, uh, that uh, we know from years of study how much you could give safely. But if you do it again, and it destroys the remaining blood vessels, then the organ won't survive. But for several reasons, it seems like more and more we are doing it again. One is that over years, there seems to be some recovery. When I was in training, we were told we couldn't radiate the brain the second time. You couldn't treat pancreas cancer a second time. Uh, but now we are. People have tried it. We're aiming better, so we're protecting normal tissues better. And we have a better understanding of how much you can give again. Again, the stomach's an unusual situation because the stomach is one of those things that is very easily damaged by radiation for unclear reasons. Or maybe, that's incorrect, maybe those older studies that said it was easily damaged, maybe they were incorrect on when people try it, it'll be okay. Does that answer the, the question? I think so. Yeah. We have a question up front on, the, on this side, and we have one in the front here. We have a... I just had a quick question about um, CyberKnife. Now, I know CyberKnife is used a lot in the brain, but have they used it in other parts of the organs so that if you need to continuously do radiation because the tumors start popping up in other parts of the organ, is that an option that can be used? Yes, so there are a lot of different technologies, and we happen to have bought the CyberKnife, uh, but there are other technologies, uh, Novalis, uh, there are other, uh, and, and a variety of technologies, and all of them are good. They're becoming more routinely available. Often, I see patients who are, who are come to us stressed out because they've been hearing about seven different technologies, and there are radio advertisements, and people have told them, you have to come here because we have this machine. There are a variety of machines that do it well, and uh, we always tell people it's really the, the driver, not the car. And if, with this kind of treatment, this intense treatment, it's important to go to a center experienced with what the person needs. Uh, and even where I work at Johns Hopkins, because of just the history of how we all settled into our roles. Uh, I treat upper GI tumors, and I treat brain tumors, and do the focus treatment in the brain. Someone else does it in the liver. So if I'm seeing a patient that's spread to the liver, I send it to someone, even within our practice, who's more knowledgeable than me about the liver. Another uh, woman does it if it spreads to the lung. So if it's in the lung, and so we'll often be passing patients among us, as we think experience is very important, because their beams are so intense that the danger is high, and the need to really aim it the best way possible is critical. Does that answer it or not? But you can treat the whole body. So you can. 
I said, well, I can ask you later. Oh, sure. We have a question could, up front. Could, radi oh, I'm so sorry. could radiation be used for diffused stomach cancer with a um, tumor growing at the um, gastric stomach? So radiation is not ideal. Surgery would be ideal if it was possible. Radi it's not because the ch we're limited for the reasons I discussed. Radiation can injure the stomach. That we're limited in how much radiation can be given. It's often said that radiation could get rid of any tumor that you can aim it at. Uh, how, however, it's usually often unsafe to give enough. And in the stomach, uh, it could be far worse than surgery because if we damage your stomach with radiation, it could break, it could start to hemorrhage, and then you know that becomes an emergency that may not be able to be dealt with quickly enough. If the stomach is just removed under controlled conditions, a surgical colleague can often <coughs> remove all of it. And then radiation is given afterwards if there's any little bits left. Um, could it be used on a tumor developing at the esophageal um, stomach junction? Yes, and it's frequently used in the esophageal gastric junction. Oh. It's, uh, it's possible to give more radiation there than you can give safely to, the, to a large area of the stomach. But again, surgery is still, we think, the ideal thing. And so maybe the rest of my colleagues can comment on, on that issue. Like when would you send someone, when would you say, okay, just treat that with radiation alone? Oh, you know, if, if it's in the, in the stomach and not the GE junction, we have had some patients that have um, completed chemo and even chemo radiation, but we don't um, get a lot of mileage out of, yeah. out of that treatment. Whereas if it's the GE <laughs> junction, uh, for some reason, that does seem to be different, whether it's a smaller area, the more focused treatment. Um, but th those patients can be monitored if, if uh, there's another reason not to jump right into surgery, and then we can um, monitor them for a recurrence, and if they have a recurrence, uh, perform salvage surgery with, with reasonable results. Um, yeah, and then cure of a gastric cancer with just radiation, chemotherapy is possible, but it's just unlikely because of the limitations compared with surgery. So when we are giving combined therapy, the GE junction is, a little, is higher, and consequently there are fewer other organs in the area, and therefore the combination of chemotherapy and radiation, one, is more effective in um, getting rid of tumor, but it's also more effective in um, damage to normal organs. Whereas the um, larger part of the stomach uh, is very close to the liver, to the kidneys, and other organs that don't tolerate as much radiation as is needed to eradicate tumor. So therefore, and it's a larger area too, the, the GE junction is small, whereas the larger area for the entire stomach uh, will therefore offer greater damage to normal structures that we have to, particip that we have to protect, and consequently, Taking care of the patient is part of what we have to do, and therefore we don't want to damage the other organs. Thank you. We it, have a question uh, over here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, to see. <laughs> classically, if you had two or three liver mets, um, uh, no one wanted to radiate it because there might be more microscopically that you couldn't see. But are you saying that your group today, if you were treating aggressively, you would try to treat those two or three liver mets? Yes, because, again, not everybody will, will do well, but a real proportion of people will. And again, by well, I mean that they will have good years ahead. Uh, and that if you just let it grow in the liver, uh, then that may become a life-limiting thing. It may damage the liver, the tumor growing. But we can eliminate three of them. If a year later there are two more, those can be treated. And you can play that out for a long time. An interesting thing is that part of the reason this may become more and more important is these new drugs that you've been hearing about that work better at small areas of spread. You know, when uh, an area of tumor escapes control, maybe it's mutated more, for some reason it started to grow. And radiation is generally effective, uh, whatever you aim it at, as long as you can give enough. So we can stop that area. 
even while the drug may be working everywhere else in the body. And so the attitude is changing, and I recently uh, saw some data that a friend of mine is about to publish, again, with, with spread to the brain, but a similar idea, looking at patients who have uh, an ALK6 mutation, and there are drugs that make these people do well because it targets an abnormality in the tumor. And when they're treating uh, this situation, oligometastasis, the Greek word meaning few, it's a few areas of spread with intense radiation or surgery, those people do very, very well in the years ahead because they have a drug that's limiting the growth everywhere else in the body where there are small deposits. So they don't end up like that image with the guy with dots everywhere growing, that it just every once in a while an area escapes control and they do something about it and becomes a, a more chronic uh, disease. I have uh, two patients that I know about who I treated uh, both with, uh, um, both actually with lung cancer that had spread to the brain. One had lung cancer, spread only to the brain, several areas confirmed with pathology. So it wasn't a mistake. Sometimes you wonder, was it a mistake? And that's why this person did well. And in America, we don't often get that much long-term follow-up. People move, they stop coming back. We have no national health system. But he friended me on Facebook uh, 12 years after we treated him for that. Uh, last year, he friended me. And I love seeing the pictures of him with his uh, eight-year-old daughter that was born after you know, we had uh, the tumor. And another woman, two areas of spread to the brain, treated at separate times because she had a treatment. A year later, another one. And then she had spread to the pancreas from her lung. And that was removed with aggressive surgery, which back then I thought was crazy. That's a big operation. But she was doing well over 10 years later. So it's the pace of the tumor. And these new drugs may keep the pace around the body slow. So dealing with a spot that grows uh, would be the right thing to do. In, in, the, in the situation with two or three Mets in the liver, yeah. Is a PET scan more helpful to you before you would radiate? Well, you'd want to confirm that's clear that it is spread and that there, it can't be some other odd process, liver cysts, infections, infectious process. But no, a PET scan uh, would not be necessary uh, treated. And again, the reason we can do this is that we can treat several areas in the liver with radiation with a great deal of safety as long as they're small enough. But removing three <laughs> different areas of the liver with surgery can be a huge deal in many situations. So you say a PET scan is not necessary? Well, you'd want to, you know, it can help you be sure that it's spread. Often a, uh, often a biopsy is done to confirm that actually is spreading, but the PET scan itself is not helpful in, in giving the radiation. You want to be sure that there's either pathologic confirmation or the imaging is convincing enough that you know that it really is spreading tumor and not one of the, not one of the many other things that can happen to the liver. And a PET scan is evidence that it's tumor, of course. I think we had a question up front. Yeah. Just to radiate the brain because there were metastases there. Yes. And then to go to chemotherapy. But we took a different route and by the advice of an oncologist and uh, basically said there are bigger fish to fry. And thank goodness those fish, after 28 cycles of frying, not, almost nothing in the brain. And can I uh, ask? I mean, is that just luck? Well, can I ask what drug it was that? DCF. Yes, and so uh, it, it, is, it is a complicated issue. The reason that you get a recommendation to treat spread to the brain as soon as it's discovered is the thought is that most drugs don't get into the brain. So a drug could be working around the body, and yet it will keep growing in the brain. So you get told to have brain radiation. Uh, and often, if it's whole brain radiation, that then delays the chemotherapy for four to six weeks in someone who has tumor all over the body. So when possible, uh, at, where, uh, at Johns Hopkins, where I work, uh, we will, even if there are many areas of spread in the brain, six or seven, tell the person to start chemotherapy 
And uh, we can do this focused radiation even to a bunch of spots. If it starts to get more than 10, it becomes unsafe, all that radiation. Because this focused radiation, we can interdigitate between cycles of chemotherapy without interrupting it. But it is all, none of us can predict the future. We don't know how it games out. We tell someone, well, we don't think the drugs will work in your brain, but for some people they do. You know, and it's a gamble you take and you never, you don't know the outcome, so I'm glad that it's worked out well for you.